Hello, welcome back to What A Future. We've had some great conversations recently. Last time we were out, we had Julian Roberts talking about vision and strategy within companies. Prior to that, of course, we had Jeff Melander for an infamous conversation about pigs. Do go check those out as well. But tonight, today, this morning, whenever you're watching, we've got an absolute fantastic guest. We've got Natasha McIntyre Hall. She's the head of regeneration at Gleeds, who also goes by the name The Mindful Regenerist. She calls herself a place futurist, a time we will explore, I'm sure, in this upcoming episode. Natasha, thank you so much for joining us. It's such a pleasure to have you with us. Absolute pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. No trouble at all. Right, we know the format, we know the way. It's the first question. What is the biggest issue affecting the world of work right now? Uh, for me, it's quite simple. It's um, it's about playfulness um, and imagination. We appear to have lost the ability to uh, play and explore. Instead, we're so eager to get from place A, where we think we are, to place B, which is the place we should be by the end of the year, usually the financial year, that we have forgotten how to have conversations around the meandering way and how we can discover things. That journey is always so important when we're looking at it in the physical environment. So the idea that we've lost that and we've lost that ability to what if with people is uh, it's a real problem. And I think it's it's really a fear of people looking silly. And I, I really think we should embrace the silly. That's interesting. I, there's a couple of uh, sort of elements you're picking up on there. One of the, one of the big ones, of course, is that sort of psychological safety, that ability to to turn around and say, "Hey, I've got this idea, and it might be stupid, but let's chat." Um, mm -hmm. Is is that sort of what, what what you mean there? And uh, is that what we should be embracing? Yeah, I think the ability to ask a question without fear of judgment, I think, is really important in the first place. Um, and I think, as I say, I. I struggle for the correct word for it but I think it really is about embracing play and being able to say right well imagine if imagine if people didn't have cars how would they get about imagine if uh, we had uh, plastic eating bacteria and so we didn't have to worry about recycling in the same way imagine if whatever it is and and that's when people's experiences become their super superpowers because if we all assume that the place that we have now is great then we're going to be very, we're not really going to look at how we can change it and what it needs to be in the future to include more people. So we need more people in the conversation. We need more diverse work, uh, workspaces, work uh, colleagues, but also getting back out into the public and engaging with them about what's important, what drives them. But we also need to bear in mind that there are people, you know, there are small people and there are older people and there's everyone in between all at a different stage of life and a different stage of, of how they want to interact with a place. So there should be no such thing as a silly question or a silly thought when you're designing place because it will be relevant to someone. But if you're a mad keen cyclist, you will see the place considerably differently than uh, someone else who um, really enjoys their car. So but it doesn't mean that one is right and one is wrong, but it does mean that we should be having these conversations and these this playful ability to have um, almost combative conversation, but without it being hurtful. And then we would come up with some different solutions that allowed us to to view the, the world in a slightly different way. I think that's really interesting. It's a, it's a game that I love to play, that kind of what if. And, um, you know, as you say, it's it's sort of often o overlooked. I think there's a there's potentially a, a sort of grander a scheme at, at play here, which is that I think as a world, do you think it's fair to say I mean, maybe we've we've looked at it slightly differently in the last few years, but certainly since the sort of 80s up until probably about 2020, the, the future was viewed as this scary thing where climate change was going to kill us all, AI was going to kill us all if climate change hadn't already got there. And, and we were all, you know, it was all bad. You know, blockbuster um, films about the future had people killing each other in the Hunger Games. And, you know, you had this kind of view that the future wasn't going to be good. And yet before that, um, you know, if you think of how the world embraced nuclear power in the in the 50s, yeah. this idea that tomorrow will always be better than today, we will, you know, the problems of of today will be solved by the, the, the technology and the and the progress of, of tomorrow. It, I suppose if we 
if we try and bring that idea back on this sort of individual level and push this this strong narrative that hey there are amazing things happening that will make the world better it, it, it does that sort of underpin this this conversation I, i'm curious to get your opinion as to whether maybe that sort of thinking is is perhaps responsible for this shift in 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 corporate thinking too I have to say, I hadn't really thought back that far, but it's a, such a good point because I remember as a child watching Tomorrow's World and there was always an excitement about what was coming next. And it does feel like actually this maybe the speed of change through the sort of technology, perhaps that has prevented people from thinking too far in the future. I think fundamentally people are scared of being wrong and a lot of that is about this polarisation of almost everything, you know, um, starting from something highly amusing, you're either a Marmite person or you're not, down to some of the serious uh, sort of economic and political problems that we've got where you are either on this side or you're on that side. Mm -hmm. And there's become much more of an intolerance towards this grey area. And the grey area is really where we could be having the conversations of like, oh, I might be wrong, but actually could we do such and such? And... For me, that's kind of where it feels, but you're, it's such a lovely point that, yeah, there was this excitement about the future and you don't feel it so often. You have to go looking for it now. And I do go looking for it because I'm so fascinated in what's coming up in Web3, blockchain, all of those sorts of things. And there are some people who are saying some wonderful things about what could come up and how we could use these things. Um but yeah, it's 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 you have to go looking for the playfulness and for that ability to be able to challenge someone without being shut down yourself. Sure, and I think that's you know as you say that that's really important, and I suppose to some degree that's about choosing who you sort of share and have these have these conversations with, mm -hmm. and. Um, I suppose also there are there are different elements that we can you know we can talk about here. We can talk about as you mentioned blockchain web three. We can talk about generative AI. We can talk about uh, robotics and you know everything that's that's kind of coming that may well be massive sea changes in in the way that we work. But also as you sort of said in in your sort of early point, it doesn't necessarily have to be looking at those macro level issues. It can be what if we view this thing from that perspective. Um, and that could simply be what if we, you know, view our procurement processes like this instead, you know, and, yeah. and even just asking those questions invites conversation that, that, that creates change. Yeah, I mean, there's a big one at the moment, which is what if we if what happens if we view our service as a product? And that's a mm -hmm. really big challenge. But actually, at the moment, local authorities need bite sized chunks. They need to product. They need to know what they're buying at a particular time and they need to know that they are not committed to something over a hugely long period of time so us who are providing a service and we've used to being saying okay well it's going to take us two years to get to there and then we'll break it down into pieces and we'll only charge you monthly that's now not giving them the certainty that they need and so we need to think about how we can re-describe what we do and I think it's quite challenging because honestly we're not necessarily the best at breaking down what makes the service as a whole so and and what points we can break it up so I think that's definitely an interesting idea when we're in the built environment one of the ideas that we talked around a lot um, in one of my previous roles was the idea that if you're building something and you want people to get fit and you want people to get out there why it's it, for the sake of a tin of paint or two why are we not setting out five kilometre loops so that people can take themselves at any time of day or night on a lit five kilometre run so that they know they'll be safe. It's a loop so they know they're going to get home. And it's become something that if you're travelling to a new town and you're staying there before a conference, you can still take yourself out on a 5k run without fear of what's going to happen to you when you're doing it. There are some really basic interventions that when we start looking at things differently, actually, there are some really obvious things that we could do which would help our community to be able to better look after itself. And, and that, what you know, what a great idea in, in its in itself, as you say, you know, for for the case of some paint and. I suppose you could even make the loop go through places that are already lit if you didn't want to provide the extra um, extra lighting. You know that that's a, a you know a sort of powerful 
um, idea that, as, as you say, is universal to to a lot of people. And, you know, you could walk the five k. You know, if not, not everyone can can run five k. That's fine. You just go walk it. or You walk it fast, or you know, sprint it if you're you know really really that good. <laughs> um, <laughs> but that leads but, uh, on to like Pokemon Go and things like that. You know, sure. I, I I play Pokemon Go. Um, I feel like I probably should be ashamed of that, but I'm not at all. And um, I used to love it. I used to work in Victoria. And so I'd be walking across uh, Westminster Bridge looking for various different Pokemon. And up on my phone, it would pop up and it would say, there is a Morecambe Wise statue just over there. And it was literally, you know, less than 30 seconds away from my normal commute into work every day. But I didn't know it was there. And I got to find out it was there by playing a game that was augmented reality I was I was finding these completely invisible things that to me were bringing me joy. No one else could see them. It wasn't interrupting anybody else's day, but it taught me something about that local neighbourhood. And I think that stuff like that is really, really powerful. And it's 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 really nice to see how easily we could make a change. Absolutely. And, you know, what what, what a great example. Another one that, that um, I remember is that when Pokemon Go first came out, um, there were so many people out walking dogs at dog shelters that they, you know, almost ran out of dogs. And yet before that, they were really struggling, uh, you know, with this. And, and as a result, you know, more people got dogs and, and you know, they looked after these, uh, you know, things. And so I, I think one of the things that I like coming back to with with these uh, sort of elements is that, you know, very small things can have knock on effects that can have further knock on effects that can, you know, continue to have knock on effects. You know, for example, um, you know, people who own dog, dog ownership is normally seen as good for, you know, for happiness. People who have dogs you know, generally uh, report higher. And very sort of tenuous stat, but, um, you know, that maybe there's a link there that you say, okay, well, you know, Pokemon Go is good for people's happiness. And this is why, because they're finding new things. They're more like, you know, it's increased this dog ownership. It's, you know, all of these things have sort of, um, you know, come out of a game uh, that, you know, some people look at and go, oh, it's a game, a waste of time. I'm not going not gonna to play that. But actually there's a, there's a huge value in, in games. You know, humans built their way of life on playing games with each other, be it sport or be it, you know, um, any any other form of, of of game that we've we've played over millions of years. Well, I think it links in really well with um, the UN Sustainability Goals. Um, I think for too long we have measured stuff. I say this as a mathematician, by the way. So for too long we've measured stuff using numbers because we know that nine is higher than three. Um, so if we want to have keep costs down, we need to go f towards the one uh, the the three end um and if we're looking for value we want to go nearer the nine end like it, it's so basic um but that's sort of the problem with it is we have to figure out how to measure other things to see what impact that we're actually having on people's lives um we did an awful lot of work of it when i was in portsmouth looking at how we could look find other metrics identify other metrics that were personal to the developments we were looking at in order to understand over the period of time why someone would want to live there because you open up a new development and you know people will want to move in there because it's new and exciting and it's been set up with thought um but in 20 years time when everything's looking a little bit worn why are people going to want to live there in 50 years time when this is a well-established community what have you done to make sure that, that that's somewhere that people still want to live? And some of the heavy hitting metrics uh, that people already know around their communities are things like life expectancy. And you know, if you're on that side of the road, actually your life expectancy is five years worse than you're on this side of the road. We should be measuring these things to understand if over time we're able to improve on those things. And then we can advertise that actually this is something that is really good for your life. This this place here and what it does by, you know, the, what are the metrics that mean that the life expectancy has improved? Well, actually, there's less trips to the GP. There's less cases of isolation. There's a bigger uptake of, of group memberships to the allotment. There is um, a... Um, rental bike scheme and um you know at any one time there's 35 percent of bikes are rented out instead of 22 on another area 
there are so many ways that we can put numbers and statistics into some really important metrics, which actually show you more and more about what life is about and what place is about and how people want to live their lives and how we would like to explain to people how they can choose a life that is correct for them. Absolutely. I, I, I wholeheartedly agree, um, you know, as a sort of mathematician myself, uh, in, in to, it's an amateur mathematician, probably. But, um, the, the, you know, numbers are incredibly powerful. And, and there's that age old saying, you know, only what gets measured uh, improves. Um, that, you know, it, you need finding metrics for things that are otherwise difficult to find metrics for is really a, a great way to be able to, you know, to work all of this. Um, because we need... We need to understand subjectivity, but we need to remain objective when we set goals and, and assess, um, you know, the value of things uh, and, and assess their success. And so I, I think that's really interesting. The, the one that I really, uh, you know, found interesting is very obvious. A lot of these things I find they're obvious once they're said, but difficult mm -hmm. to find until they are. And, and one there is, you know, if you want to assess life expectancy, OK, great. But to some degree, you have to wait for everyone to die and see what where, where they got to. But if you can instead look at GP call outs or, or you know, or, or um, uh, appointments in that area, then that gives you a much better, uh, you know, live update on it. You can you can look at that on an annual basis. You can even look at it on a six monthly, quarterly basis, whatever, whatever it is that you need in order to, to assess that. And by doing that, then we can move into feedback cycles that then say, OK, well, we, we see that this might not have had the effect that we want. So what mm -hmm. what are the sort of things that we can do now and, and actually sort of look at that and improve it rather than just a sort of, um, you know, one and done kind of, oh, it's out the door, we'll never touch it again kind of uh, thing, which if you're waiting and, and unaware of what's happening, it becomes inevitable uh, that, that that's the sort of attitude. Yeah, it's, for me, I just feel like, first of all, not enough projects start off with a clear vision. Like, why are we doing this project? Because if you don't know why, don't do it. If it's just mm -hmm. because you've got housing numbers that you need to satisfy, that's not okay. Like, what is the reason? Why is this the place that you've identified that those houses should go? What's important about the connections to there? What's the history? Let's understand. And that's one of the reasons why I really strongly believe that local authorities are actually the key to leading most large regeneration projects because they've already got legacy baked in and they already care about what's going to happen, who these people are, where they're coming from. And I think that that's really important. But I think like breaking these things down as well further, it's GP visits is a really cracking example because actually in a lot of places you find that if you've got a good library, your GP visits are down anyway because it's another place that people can go free. They don't need to buy a coffee, they don't need to do anything and they're guaranteed a conversation because they can walk up there and then they can speak to the person behind the till about whatever it is. So I think we have to understand that loneliness is a problem, which I think we do. But I also it, that tends to come under sort of the mental health thing, whereas actually it doesn't necessarily have to. Maybe that's something that's that's done by looking at community. Maybe um, I think it's in I think it's the Netherlands, but I might be wrong, where they have benches that are different colours. And if you go and sit on them, they're traffic lights. So if you go and sit on the green one in your lunchtime, you're up for having a conversation. So if someone comes and sits on the green bench next to you, you guys can chat and you don't need to know who you are. If you sit on a red bench, you're not up for a conversation. And so people won't come and bother you. Just little interventions like that. Like you've got to have the conversation of like, OK, how would you start a conversation with a stranger here? Oh, OK, well, what we'd have is um, we want to have some piece of art that's interactive, but it takes two people to get it going. Mm -hmm. And so therefore you need someone else to come and get involved in this. Or we used to refer to them as water cooler moments. What's happening at this point, and it may well be a view or it may be a garden or it may be um, interaction of something, um, whatever it is. But what's happening at that point so that you can turn to a complete stranger and go, weather's a bit rubbish, isn't it? And it doesn't matter. Then you just start up a conversation or, you know, or what's this? Or have you played with that? Or it, it's... All of these things are about providing people with an opportunity to, to open up to someone without having to know them. When those things start happening, you find there are less GP visits because you're not having to use the GP to tackle loneliness. 
And I do find it a shame sometimes that we're not able to look at these things more holistically in that this project actually may well not be financially viable on its own, but the impact it's going to make to the mental health of these people and the impact it's going to have on the long term, uh, uh, you know, their, their life expectancy or their long term health, then that is X, Y and Z. Um, so we haven't got the communication to do that, but it doesn't mean to say we shouldn't be trying to make the best places we possibly can. I mean, I think there's a couple of things there that I want to bring. One of them is that um, there was a great Britishism there um, for any of our international uh, viewers. <laughs> if you ever want to start a conversation, comment on how bad the weather is. That's Absolutely. the first uh, sort of rule of, of British. Um, but I think the second thing is that we need to give you more paint um, because I think, you know, we've, we've got three great things there that are solved by paint. We've got some sort of art project uh, that, that, that works. We've got um, benches in different colours and we've got 5K uh, run loops. Like, I'm going to start a petition. Let's give Tash some paint. We've got <laughs> solutions. Uh, this is great. But I think, you know, we've, we've kind of looked around a, a lot of different things here and, and talked about, um, as you mentioned, that that process, that, that you know, what, when we start, asking those extra questions, we start to find uh, more solutions. And if, if, as you said, you know, kind of nicely illustrated, you know, if the project doesn't have an understanding of all of the effects it's going to have, then it misses uh, lots of opportunities, ultimately. And, and, and getting that information is, is, is really powerful. Now, as a, uh, a place futurist, as, as, as previously mentioned, um, I, I want to jump into the second question. Um, because I want to start thinking more about what world we, we, we could live in. So let's let's say, uh, you know, we fixed this problem. We have fixed the lack of questions, the lack of playfulness, the lack of, of, of really <laughs> digging into these issues. Uh, and everyone is, is going full steam ahead. W what does that world look like? How does how does it feel? You know, what 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 what, what is it? I want to know. <laughs> So I'll give you some of the ideas that are rattling around in my head at the moment, things that I think could happen and they could give people more autonomy over the places that they live. Now, I will caveat all of this by saying I could be wrong. I'm quite happy to be wrong if what is, has actually happened is I'm wrong because the progression has gone in a different direction. Mm -hmm. As part of what these conversations are is that someone can go, well, actually, that's we, we're not going to do it that way. We'll do it this way. Absolutely fine. But if anyone has ideas on this or it sparks ideas, want to have conversations, then please come talk to me, come talk to Fraser, come talk to anybody. Just mm -hmm. start having these conversations because the more of these that go on, the better the ideas will become. So um, idea number one. Um, for anyone idea who... Idea number one, please. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> idea number one. Um, for anyone who has read um, Donut Economics this the whole concept won't be alien to you, but it's the idea of having a localised currency. Now, we have the ability to do that already now through blockchain um, and cryptocurrency. So every blockchain has its own cryptocurrency. Some of them have shared crypto, but it then allows you to assign a value to something that's happening in that space, which is predominantly digital virtual. Imagine, though, that within your community that we've built that has a 5K loop and, and painted benches and water cooler moments and everyone's living in, uh, in harmony, you will still have some people that earn a lot of money, fear, so English pounds or, or whatever the government uh, currency is. They will earn that, but they earn all of that somewhere over there. And so they're not necessarily engaged within the community. You will have someone else who earns little fear, but they are of tremendous importance to the uh, to the community. They may well walk people's dogs, do people's shoppings. They they may care for the elderly, whatever it is, but that is not actually compensated well in um, in fear. Now, imagine that us as a community have, a per have the ability to reward that person for the deeds that they're doing within so through this localised currency, so we're paying them in ETH and they are then able to use that money to spend within the community and the community becomes something where it, it looks after both fear and ETH and that then means that people can be valued in different ways. So there are lots of ideas about how you can do this without necessarily needing cryptocurrency, so 
I think it's in Germany where you can, uh, once you get to the age of 55, you can donate your time, you can volunteer your time to then go and look after people who are older who need it for simple things like company when they're eating and checking they're okay, things that don't require any medical knowledge. And then when you get to the age where you want to start cashing it back in, whatever you've put into that bank, you can then remove from that bank. And the later that you start using it, a bit like your pension, the more of it you've got. But I also, you know, imagine the idea of, of being able to use your your localised currency to be able to purchase stuff at the shop or be able to do these things. I think we've got so reliant on understanding what money is and what value is. And I think the next generation are highly aware of the fact that value, as we currently have it, is not fair. So is there a way of being able to recognize that fairness differently differently in communities i think that cryptocurrency could have a key to unlocking some of that for us i remember you talking about this um when i when i saw you at the gatwick uh summit did an excellent keynote there and and this really captured uh you know what i was it really captured me and i've been thinking about it a lot uh since I've been sceptical of, of cryptocurrency and blockchain largely because uh, of the somewhat excessive amounts of hype around it and the, and the fact that, um, you know, the, the underlying thing is good, but if people are buying it for reasons other than the, the underlying reason, then it, it, it sort of creates an unstable uh, market. I suppose I haven't got much, much further than that in my thinking, so more, more for me. Um, but I, I think that's a really interesting idea. It comes back to, you know, Einstein's uh, assertion that, you know, if you, if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree it'll, mm -hmm. it'll look like an idiot and and uh, as you say you know there is um you know economic value in in you know paying ceos who run large companies lots of money to do so so that the company can become bigger and and that okay it benefits shareholders it also benefits the people it employs the communities it's in etc in that kind of uh, more traditional economic sense but as you say there's the you know areas that that kind of are unfairly valued by that economic system, and I think that's that's a really important uh, thing that that can and should be should be addressed. And again, when you say it, it, it sounds so simple. We, we should we should be doing that yesterday. Um, <laughs> can it be solved with a with a can of paint? That's what I want to know. Because, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, that, I think that's that's really you know power. What if you, for example, um, went even? Uh, I'm thinking of cans of paint now. What if you had, um, you know, the fact that people who were caring for the elderly could skip a checkout queue? You know, even just little yeah. gestures yeah. like that that say, you know what, fair play well, to you. You know, you do this thing. As much as again, uh, I know COVID was horrific for so many people, but if we think about some of the things that were achieved then yeah i mean nhs got to skip queues vulnerable vulnerable people got to skip queues during that time all of these things are possible and the mechanism was put in place in a temporary way but what if we can bring it back by having these different things by the way that ability there to demonstrate that you are the person that you say that you are in order to be able to skip queue you could do that very effectively with blockchain just and nfts just saying <laughs> yeah, absolutely well does that does that lead us on to idea number two please yeah <laughs> idea number two please yes um, idea number two is um so traditionally a artist creates several different parts of an nft um and you could have literally thousands and thousands and thousands of these things what happens is when you see one that you like you mint it it becomes real and the artist will then limit it so that there's a certain number of these things each one generally comes with a royalty clause so then it's it's beholden on the artist to try and make sure that that community has value that value may well be in a membership to a physical place or it may well be online perks, um, concerts, um, passes, shopping, whatever, whatever the thing is. But by doing that, by investing in the community, you can raise the value of that community so that when it was then sold, the royalty comes back into it. And so it becomes a, a self-fulfilling prophecy, essentially, of, of this community becoming greater. Um, all of that 
really important, really good to understand, and also links into the fact that the fastest growing, more eff- most effective communities at the moment are all online. So as place people, we should be watching that because they're doing that without us. So wh- where do we sit with that? We need to be involved in that conversation because we could help them design better communities or they could help us design better communities or both. So that's, I think, really interesting. Sticking to our NFT community and what it does. Now imagine that instead of having that artist, imagine that what's happening is the council or an entity draws a red line around an area and everyone within it has a piece of unique documentation, which is essentially their NFT, which gives them ownership into that community. Now, these sorts of communities have a thing called um, a DAO, which is a decentralized autonomous organization. Now, very briefly, what that is, is a decision making organization that every person who has an NFT within that community has a vote. So one NFT, one NFT, one vote. So if we were talking about place, that would be one proof of residency um, gives you one vote within that DAO. DAOs can also hold property and they can hold um, value. So imagine now that the council need to build an extra 200 homes within this red line. And instead of going out, commissioning someone and saying, where should we do these 200 homes? And then bringing it back to the community and saying, we've done a drawing and we think 200 homes should go over there. How do you feel about it? Please let us know in this location where we're going to be for three days and then we're going to go back and review it. That is permissive. What happens if what they did is they give the money to the DAO and say, you need to put an extra 200 homes in somewhere, but here is the money. You may commission your own design team and you come back to us within a set period of time and tell us where you would like those 200 homes. Now that DAO, that community, will then be able to commission someone like me Um, to be able to say to pull together a team and then say actually what we've done is we've looked at it and we can put 50 over here 50 over here 50 over here um, and we're going to go slightly higher to make sure that we can actually improve the value of the uh, public realm this is what we think and you hand it back to the council that could then be ingrained as policy which then means when developers come on board they know what they need to do in order to satisfy the community and so then we're looking at consensual rather than permissive development. And that I think is incredible. The fact that, that there, there is something that we could do which would mean that people really have a say in what's going on in their area. Because I think too quickly we assume that people are NIMBYs, whereas we're not asking them the right question. We must build 200 homes because there is a need for these units. You tell us how you would like them to integrate within your community because these are going to be members of your community. These are not just a block. It's not just a block of flats we're building on the outskirts. These are people who are going to have something to offer. And I think that that could be a really interesting way of considering it. I, I think, yeah, uh, total. Uh, what I love there is is um, uh, like your, your little catchphrase of that of idea number two was um, was an, an imagine if an, an imagine if and, and you know, and each thing builds upon it. OK, so, you know, this this bit makes sense. This block makes sense. No. So now imagine if this thing could be done and, the, and then we can make that block make sense. And imagine if and this goes back exactly to, to what you're saying. You've kind of just done it on your own there, um, you know, about having that um, that constant. Uh, sort of playfulness that what if that that where next uh you know kind of kind of attitude um that that pushes uh these sorts of conversations if we don't have these conversations nothing ever happens you know to, to coin the song um but um I, I think that's that's really interesting look I, I want to um we're running low on time I kind of wish this could go on forever to be honest but um you know we're running a little bit a little bit low I, I wanted to to see if you have any suggestions that people can take away on how they can um utilize this kind of thinking in in their lives and and how they can they can uh, you know they can do that is, is there anything that comes to mind oh it's it's not rocket salad at all it's just <laughs> Whatever it is that you care about is what gives you your superpower. And people come from all sorts of different backgrounds and they care about different things. Like 
I've never been and never will be a cyclist. So I don't know how irritating it is when you have to share a lane with the bus. I can imagine because I've had these conversations, but someone who does care about these things needs to be there and they need to be able to say, well, hang on a second, what if? The same as if you're in a wheelchair or if you care for somebody who who um, struggles with their eyesight or someone who's got four kids, you know, that's people who love walking their dog. All of these people are completely valid human beings and there must be spaces where we're not catering for them well enough. And so it just needs to be a conversation of like, could we? What if? What if is my favourite? Because what if quite often, once you get going, your brain really takes over and it takes you to the place that you want to go? You know, the um, NFT example I just gave you there, you know, when you start thinking about it, you're like, well, what if? If it was an NFT community and we worked really hard and we got those 200 homes and actually we got this improved public realm, then suddenly more people would want to live there because we've proved that life expectancy had gone up. And so if it's more valuable and then when we leave, if there was a royalty clause, then there'd be an additional payment into that thing and so it will become a stronger better community and more people will you know it's whatever it is don't just say your little idea and go talk to people spend time with people who will then go well then what well then what but in a supportive way and once that happens once you can actually find someone where you can have a conversation and go oh i've basically got this brain itch um, I've seen this thing happening over there and I don't understand what the point of it is, but what if we could do that? Maybe that would work. What if we could um, get our, we could go out to public engagement and we could take mid journey with us and people could describe what they want in the area and we could mock it up on mid journey and they could say, yes, that's what I would like it to look like. Or that represents the idea that I've got in my head. And so then we wouldn't have to rely on words which can be interpreted differently, but instead we would end up with pictures like, you know, I wouldn't go to the hairdresser without a picture to say, this is roughly what I want. There, there are so many ways that we could improve connection with other human beings and so just be curious. And when someone says something to you that you just think is just ridiculous, be curious about how they got there. Don't shut it down. That's an interesting one. It's, it's so easy, that, that instinct of, no, that disagrees with the thing that I think, and therefore I'm going to tell you no. Like, it's so easy uh, to, to do that and, and, you know, really... Uh, unkind as well unfortunately mm. um but i think it's it's yeah it's really powerful to turn around and say i haven't looked at it that way oh, well how'd you get there you know it's an easy again an easy question to ask um and it, and it invites conversation and uh you know experiences that you wouldn't otherwise know i think that's that's a single really good bit of advice you know don't shut down an idea just because it disagrees yeah. with what you think play improv at work instead of the no because go for the yes and Sure. No, that's a good one. Um, yeah, Im improv is, I remember that from my uh, dr drama, you know, theatre studies days at school. It's a, it's a scary, but otherwise, it's, you know, very, very exciting place to be. Um, I think that's that's another great bit of advice. Look, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, to have you with us today. Thank Tash. you so much um, for having me. It's, uh, it's, it's been brilliant. Uh, this, is, this is what it's all about, you know, looking at the future and saying, how can we make it better than what it is today? Because there's so much out there and we just need to go and go and grab it. And, and you've been absolutely brilliant. Thanks. Thanks again. Really, absolute really Absolute pleasure. It. Thank you so much for having me. No, no worries. Cheers. Hello. If you enjoyed today's episode, please do like and subscribe. If you want to find out more about me, you can find me on LinkedIn. Or if you want to find out more about what Water's trying to achieve, then do take a look at our website. Links to both are below. Thanks so much for joining us and looking forward to seeing you next time.